In the area of freedom of expression, I think that a lot of advocacy groups and politicians and scholars are rightly focusing on the area of content and usage of information, but I fear that what's being missed here is more of the infrastructural area that we sometimes take for granted on the internet because infrastructure is not necessarily taken care of. There are still problems in infrastructure that need to be addressed. I'll give a few different examples. One is at a very basic level of um, what I'll call, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but I'll call it the kill switch issues. We see in various places around the world, especially in the last five years, governments deciding that they're going to cut off internet services to their citizens. They do this for a variety of uh, political reasons. But it's not just happening in um, areas where there are repressive governments. We had an example recently in the United States in which the Bay Area Rapid Transit Agency in San Francisco decided to cut off the wireless uh, private services that were in their station to, in the, um, before a protest was scheduled to happen. So we see these infrastructure things happening. That's a very obvious example. It also happens at a less obvious example of infrastructure, areas that are hidden to the public but nevertheless make decisions about um, freedom of expression. One example of that, and probably the best example that I can say just off the cuff, is what happened to WikiLeaks after the Cablegate incident. There were several decisions that were made by private corporations that cut off services to WikiLeaks. This happened with Amazon.com, whereby they cut off the hosting services. WikiLeaks servers were hosted by Amazon, and they made a decision to cut that off. At a different level, financial services companies cut off the flow of money to WikiLeaks. We saw this with Visa, with MasterCard, with PayPal, and uh, a few other ones. And then at an even more invisible level, the the company that was providing domain name hosting services called EveryDNS made a decision to stop resolving the domain name WikiLeaks.org into its um, binary address. So they stopped that. They claimed that it was because their service was under attack by a distributed denial of service attack. There are various rationales for these uh, cutting off of services that I could go into. But the the information that I want to flag here is that here we have private companies making decisions about freedom of expression online, whereby governments used to decide this. So the, the, the ultimate message is that we have to think about freedom of expression not just through the lens of uh, negative liberties, such as the absence of state sponsorship, uh, censorship, the absence of state censorship, but we have to think about it through the standpoint of the positive liberties of preserving infrastructures of free expression. So that's what my current research addresses. We're completely dependent on these internet governance structures already. Um, it probably will increase over time, but I would posit that we're completely dependent already. It happens at a number of different levels, some more visible than others. At the more invisible level, we have entire infrastructures of standard setting. We have these global institutions that make decisions about how technology is designed, and their decisions are of a very technical nature, very complex. There's a concealed complexity here. But the decisions they make in technical design also determine civil liberties, our extent of privacy online, our ability to access information. So this is a whole infrastructure on which we're dependent upon these global institutions. Um, at a different level, we have the technologies of Internet governance, like the Internet's domain name system. This is, I'll just use this as one example. This is an area that has always served a very, very specific, simple function. Yes, there have been a lot of policy controversies around it over time, but it served a very simple uh, function of just translating between the domain names that we use to access a website, such as American.edu, and the binary numbers that computers can access. Very, very straightforward. But now we see the domain name system at the center of a number of um, controversial public interest issues, such as now providing some copyright enforcement. We see that even in the United States right now, where uh, the domain name system is being used to uh, filter out domain names that are aligned with sites that are geared towards piracy, like trademark infringement, uh, such as um, providing pirated movies and videos. So it brings up a lot of um, issues about access to knowledge, about the problem of piracy, about the problem of who decides what is piracy, in it, because you have different national laws and you have this infrastructure that traverses all these different national boundaries. And then just the technical issue about what these kinds of decisions could do to the technical operation of the Internet. 
Well, a concerned citizen. What can a concerned citizen do? Um, I think that just becoming educated about the issues um, in one area I think that consumers are already moving into is um, privacy, issues of privacy and anonymity. I think that's going to be a big question in the next few years. Do we even have anonymity right now? I mean, that's, we can't even make that assumption right now. There are different levels of anonymity online. But this is something that younger people are very concerned about. There seems to be this narrative that young people are giving up on privacy, but that's not necessar necessarily the case. So I think paying attention to things like corporate policies about privacy, whether it's a social networking company or a search engine company, is important. And then the market can decide. People can make individual decisions about whether they want to embrace a certain product based on that. Well, there are certain issues. I mean, there are a host of issues in the internet governance landscape that w where there already is activism. Uh, so let me give you one example of this. Um, and this is just my own personal opinion. We're focusing so much attention as citizens and as scholars and as activists on the use of social networking for dissent. But we should be focusing as much attention, and people are now, now starting to do this, on the use of social networking techniques by repressive governments to identify protesters. Right? So looking at the good and bad side of this, um, taking to the streets, um, I think a lot of this is very difficult to translate into offline protest. But um, issues of privacy, issues of the use of social networking by repressive um, governments. I think there's some activism around net neutrality issues. So I, I think that there is an educated consumer base, but there's also the problem about have it, having to raise these issues to a more general audience when it's, it involves the more concealed complexity. I'm actually trying to do this right now with a book that I'm writing called Global Internet Governance. It will be my next book publication. It's being published by the Yale University Press. And the idea behind it is to expose some of the internet governance issues and what is at stake for the public.